inspired by this confidence we, we right. fly into the old virgin of virgins our mother before they become sinful and sinful and sorrowful oh mother of the word incarnate despise not my petition but in thy mercy hear and answer me amen in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, Kyle, it's great to it's great to uh, to to see you again uh, and have another one of these conversations. Today, I, I wanted to talk to you about the uh, uh, going through my notes. I'm working I'm working now to put support staff manual the, so that this will be the team manual for those that are using uh, the protocol diocesan wide. So uh, I'm going through my notes uh, back when when. Recall that our diocese here was the, was one of the first dioceses to do the protocol um, after you rolled it out. Uh, I think it was 2016, um, and uh, I came across your notes and and um, um, and the and the phraseology reject, renounce, rebuke any spirits associated with past behavior. So I want to talk a little bit about about that the origin of that. Here's what I've got for the 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 new manual. Um, and I, and, and, uh, um, and I'm talking about how we can use this, this prayer and how this fits into the overarching schema or programmatic of the four phase protocol. While the demon office, the demon always tries to obfuscate, always tries to hide. And so, uh, here's what I wrote to prevent the flow of grace. He employs various tactics, hiding, trying to convince you to stop praying, tempting you to return to past sins and destructive behavior. Demons particularly hide, according to Father Ripperker, in areas of weakness, all the while, quote, probing and testing limits to see what they can get away with. Thus, I say you can unmask a demon through penance, the development of virtue, good mental hygiene, and learning how to reject, renounce, and rebuke the vices and spirits which afflict your soul. Note the inner logic of this formula as it increases in severity according to the intentionality of the penitent. In dealing with the, any spirit or vice, Number one, separate yourself from it with an act of the will. Reject. Cut yourself off free from any entanglements due to participation with it. Renounce and address it directly and cast it away in the name of Jesus Christ from the authority given by God the Father over your own body and soul. Therefore, rebuke. Once a demon and concomitant vice, concomitant vice and spirit defect or spiritual defect is uncovered, you now reject, renounce, and finally rebuke it to allow grace to do its work. I brought in um, and quoted a, a modern psychologist um, who came up with the phrase, if you can name it, you can tame it in terms of emotion psychologically. And I think this is this this application is naming and taming, uh, so to speak. You, it's, it's not a magic pill. This is not a, this is there's no magic to this or superstition. What this is, is being able to identify spirits, defects and vices, because these spirits, defects and vices attract the demon. They create a psychological compatibility that becomes attractive, that principle of like unto like. And so using this formula within the overarching programmatic of, of the four faith protocol is very important. So um, tell me a little bit more about the, the development of, of this phraseology and, and uh, how you've seen this work uh, across in different, with different teams and with different cases you've seen over the years. So very succinctly, Dan, you described the process in, its, in, um, in a final form. As we developed this process, this process was developed uh, in response to primarily recidivism. And so I'll take you to uh, the development of this process in the early 2000s in South Texas. I was working with several exorcists down there. Uh, one particular one, Father James Irving, OMI, God rest his soul. Um, and what we were finding is that uh, we could affect liberation, but we couldn't sustain liberation. The individuals couldn't sustain liberation. So we began to analyze the data set. What is the commonality of, of the recidivism of the re-affliction, if you will? And so quite prominent in, in this was cursing interfamilial cursing, cultural cursing, uh, communal cursing. And so what we found was is these people were seeking freedom, but they weren't willing to uh, make the radical change in their life, including the severing of relationships. And so we started to develop this uh, renounce, reject, and rebuke formula. In its earliest form, it was uh, to sever relationships. And it was to uh, get rid of the material accoutrement of those relationships. 
this is extremely difficult to do, especially in extended family situations and ongoing contact. But that's how it started in this form uh, was in the early 2000s to address um, uh, predominantly recidivism pro issues um, in the cases that we were seeing uh, in South Texas. Right, right. The language, it, it, in the language of theology, we, we speak of freedom from, but also freedom for. We have been, we have been freed from, this is Pauline uh, from St. Paul. Christ, for freedom, we've been set free. We've been set free from sin, death, slavery, uh, but we also have been freed for. And oftentimes I think people look for in, in, in the exorcist community or in different models, they try to find a quick fix. They fall in, they fall into, uh, you know, want to just circumvent the system to try to try to find a quick way through. Uh, and sometimes it just takes time. Freedom from means freedom for. And what is that freedom for? Uh, the definition, the Catholic definition of liberation is, is union reconciliation with God the Father through Christ. And it must have a sacramental element. And it must have a, 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 and a sacrificial element. So freedom from brings us to freedom for union with God, reconciliation with God the Father. It must be sacramental and it also must be uh, a sacrificial. So learning to suffer, to offer your suffering up uh, is, is very critical. And this is part of the reject, uh, uh, renounce and rebuke because these, these different vices, spirits and defects cling to the soul. And this is what weighs the soul down and, and these become obstacles or obeses is the technical term and obex means a blockage an obstacle these are the obex obeses that block grace from flowing into the soul that keep you freedom from so the goal of the goal is not just to be demon free it's to absolutely grow in complete union with god and holiness You're absolutely right, Dan. We saw that this was such an integral part to uh, liberation. You know, you have several uh, touchstones here. Uh, one is our Lord saying, uh, who are my brothers and sisters, those who keep my father's commandments. Um, he's, uh, he speaks again, um, if a man doesn't hate his father, hate his mother, meaning if he doesn't reorder his life to uh, the bonds of community, uh, Christian community, um, Catholicism, uh, the, the family can either be a platform from which one may ascend or it can be an anchor which drags one down. And so uh, the right ordering of familial relationships is, it, it, this cuts across all cultures. And so uh, the right ordered relationship with family and the right ordered relationships in general, we looked at what did historically as we developed protocol uh, Father Ripperger and I developed protocol um, and then took this to the Leo the 13th Institute as we said, what, you know, what are we looking at um, historically and traditionally? And it goes back to Pope uh, St. Paul, of course, in his admonition Corinthians 15. But the other one was um, expounding on that. You have Pope St. Leo the Great, who wrote in a series of homilies about holy and unholy alliances. And he essentially says, you will assume the attributes or defects of those with whom you associate. And he's exactly right. Um, and so building on that, uh, you come forward. There's you know, nothing new under the sun, says Coelith. It's, it's, all this, it's the same old shoot 'em up just different players. Uh, in the 90s, there was a, a uh, Protestant uh, author, speaker, father, uh, not father, uh, doctor, James Dobson had a program called Focus on the Family, and he coined a term called soul ties. And so this is no more than the holy and unholy alliances speak from uh, Pope St. Leo the Great. And what essentially he says is there are certain activities which join souls together. Uh, classic example, and Dobson kind of limited his work to this, was uh, the conjugal act. The conjugal act is a spiritual act and it bonds souls. If it occurs outside ma sacramental ma matrimony, then um, it bonds souls, but in a negative way. And so we started looking at this, um, what are positive bonds? What are holy bonds? Those who pray together, those who fast together, those who keep the vigils. This is the Christian brotherhood uh, of monastic community. Very, very powerful, very, very effective. 
the reciprocal or the reverse of that, the corruption of that, is uh, when two or more are gathered in the name of sin, Satan, when they are gathered in a nefarious or sinful behavior, the Holy Spirit is not present to that, but there is spirits present to it. And so we found that the breaking of these soul ties uh, through the reject, renounce, and rebuke formula was very, very effective. Um, but it, it had to be done, and it had to be done methodically. And so this, this understanding and this teaching uh, then began to, to disseminate to exorcist, um, and, and it was proven to be very, very effective. But it is contextual. It has to occur in part of an overall program that you talked about. You identify impediments to grace. This is only one of the types of impediments to grace. But habitual mortal sin and other activity uh, will have the same effect. But we, we, developed the, we developed the RRR formula as a very methodical, sequential way to address these types of impediments and defects. Right, and I think I think uh, this is something that appeals to to our common human experience. You know, um, Father Ripperger defines a negative soul tie as a spiritual bond between two individuals, normally as a result of mutual sin committed together or the sin of one committed against another. So, sexual sins, abortion, criminal activity, other violations of the moral teachings of the church. These have the opposite effect of what. Pope uh, St. Leo the Great talked about this, this, um, this, these alliances that bring peace. Uh, unholy alliances bring the opposite. They have ligatures that connect these common sins. You, you, you create, you created, you created a, a you created a ligature, a bond uh, with other people. Even uh, modern psychology, social, social scientists, there's one, um, that's not coming from a Christian perspective, Carla, Carla Maria Manley, she defines a soul tie as an emotional or spiritual courting an inexplicable, powerful, emotional bond to another person. And again, the, the, there's a broad appeal. We understand this in our human nature, there's certain things, and it ties back into the memory. So the three R, the three R formula uh, helps you go back to help purify the memory. And, and so breaking the soul ties using this formula and, and other formulae is, is very helpful to, to sever those ligatures of psychological emotional ligatures it is part of the, the honestly it's part of the temporal punishment due to sin we, we can break the we, we can sacramentally confess the sins that were created through unholy acts but we also can sever them through through a willful act and then once you sever them through the willful act you're now set in a position to offer the prayers so you know what i when i counsel cases and walk them through the protocol when, when once you break the soul ties and you learn to use this 3r formula what it does is it allows you to now do something as with that with those memories and the something with those memories isn't to retell the story over and over and over again it's taking those and uniting those that story with the suffering of Christ. And so, and so the three R formula, the real power of it is when you unite your suffering, uh, either in atonement for your own sins or as vicarious, vicarious atonement and reparation for the sins of others, um, sp specifically when those, those bonds were created in an unholy manner. Precisely right. Uh, there's the other aspect to that is there is uh, when we talk about in the formula to liberation, our uh, our steps to liberation, and you you talk about there's two aspects to this. There's a temporal and a spiritual. So the severing of the soul ties and the rejecting, renouncing, and rebuking addresses the relationship. It, it addresses the spiritual aspect of it. But also part and parcel to the uh, reject, renounce, and rebuke is the disposition of the material goods requisite with the relationship. What does that mean? It means the um, disposing of destroying, in many cases, these goods, these temporal goods, these things, these objects, which bear witness to uh, the, the relationship, um, especially illicit relationships. So if you're keeping clothing that the ex-boyfriend bought you and you're in a marriage, uh, you, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Because once that item is seen, then there's an emotional response. There is a psychological response and you're pulled out of vocation. 
or you're misdirected, uh, your faculties are misdirected. So it's very, very important, um, this disposition of temporal goods. And this is another movement that we've seen. And, and uh, early on, what we said to the people was, just bring us your occult items, we'll bless them, we'll burn them, we'll destroy them. And what we found was, this was not near as effective as having the people participate in the destruction and or disposition of these illicit items, these items that were these, these uh, material things. And so for them to participate, for them to destroy those items uh, that tied them to evil. Um, this was the scriptural precedent to this is multi is manifold. One is um, as the Israelites or the Hebrews were entering into the promised land and there's a sacrifice at every step as they cross the Jordan, um, they're severing the ties to the false deities that they worshiped in uh, in Egypt. And so there's a cleansing, there's a divestiture there, there's a, there is a rejecting, renouncing, and rebuking uh, formula that you see. More poignant, you see this uh, in conversion uh, to Catholicism in adults. And a classic case is uh, Bishop Rumagus, who uh, receives Clovis, king of the Franks, into uh, the church. And essentially, he tells him, uh, now burn that which you once worshipped and worship that which you once burned, meaning the accoutrement, uh, the effects, the sacramentals that you destroyed uh, of, of the Christians. Now you must worship these things. You must venerate these things. And then the pagan objects, uh, all of those things must be uh, destroyed. We see direct conflict in this when we're letting these objects of uh, diabolical um, uh, affection and affectation work their way into the liturgy. That's a totally another subject. But uh, suffice it to say, there's a temporal and spiritual aspect to the three R formula. One of the things I think <clears throat> uh, you touched upon, I'm looking here in my notes back from 2016. Um, I want to touch upon this and 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 maybe wrap it up. Um, wrap it up after that. Time. One of the things I got in my notes from you: time and urgency fall away. And I think this is very critical for, for, for team members working in this, in this particular uh, apostolate. Time and urgency must fall away. Urgency is of the demon. So this is not an urgent ministry. We find ourselves getting caught up in, oh, we got to do this. We got to do that. The demon is constantly pushing. You know, how many times have we, somebody calls from the diocese, oh, this person called and they demand to see the exorcist right away. You know, as we've learned that anyone that's demanding to see the exorcist right away is probably not possessed. It's probably psychological. But this descent, but the demon is constantly getting us to a sense of urgency. Our lady is 100% in control of this ministry. And so, and so we must have a holy detachment. That part of that holy detachment is allowing time and grace to work so that everything creaturely gets rightly reordered to creator. And I think that's a key concept. Can you comment on that, Kyle? Well, you're exactly right. It's, it's, it is a, it's a sequence. We, we talk about this process is sequential. It's not chronological. And from the sequential thing, first of all, there has to be the repentance, the desire for change. Then there has to be the metanoia, the tangible things, the movement in the will, and included in that movement in the will, that metanoia, that that is this reject, renounce, and rebuke formula. Uh, and then there has to be a living of it. There has to be a reordering. And if you're hearing echoes of the uh, the act of contrition, if you're hearing echoes of these things, this is this is very very Catholic. This is very very Christian. This is this goes back to to Christ and and to Saint Paul saying you you have to. Um, the old man, the, the uh, old self has to die so that you can become a new creation in Christ. We talk about dying in Christ. We talk about, and, and the death analogy um, is very, very poignant because no temporal things come through the, the you know, death. You know, you can't take it with you. That, that saying, when you reorder your life to Christ and you convert, just like Clovis did, he was commanded and he did destroy everything inconsistent with his newfound Catholic faith. And that's what's key here is you, you have to destroy both interiorly and exteriorly everything 
that is inconsistent with your Catholic faith. The idea that we can agree to disagree. No, we cannot. The obligation of conversion, the obligation of ongoing conversion for ourselves and those of the world demands that, that there's a zero tolerance policy for the unclean. And currently our clergy has lost this. This is a misunderstanding of ecumenicism. Again, that's another topic for another day. But the reject, renounce, and rebuke formula first was introduced to uh, in that form and in those words to exorcists working um, in these cases in the early 2000s. It was first enumerated and, and talked about in that form and the necessity to address both the spiritual and temporal components. This was introduced to a gathering of exorcists in Mundelein in 2005. Then it became part of uh, the Leo teaching and it had a, a, a place there. Um, Father Carl Schmidt, um, Monsignor John Essa, uh, Father John Hamps, those that were working in this field received this tool and then took this tool into the field. But they understood that in order for this to be effective, it has to be contextual. It has to be part of an ongoing movement. This is not something that we can pick up and, and simply use in isolation and expect a positive result. And in fact, it will bring a negative result if this is used by itself without a uh, firm amendment to change life, to cease habitual mortal sin, to reorder one's life to, uh, to Christ. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a scripture scholar, so I'm going to give you a, a, a three R's from the Acts of the Apostles that I think are consistent with the three R's of this formula. In Acts 2, at, the, at Peter's speech at Pentecost, he says, Peter says to them in Acts 237, when they heard Peter's proclamation of the gospel, they were cut to the heart and they asked Peter and the other apostles, what are we to do, my brothers? Peter says to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises made to you and your children, to those who are far off, whoever the Lord will call. So the three R's of, of Pentecost, repent, first and foremost, there must be an, in, a metanoia, and baptize, the people that come to us are largely Catholic, so it's not just baptize, it's renew, so you repent, that's requisite, there must be repentance, You're then a renewal of the baptismal promises. The demon catches every single inconsistency that, that is inconsistent with the indelible mark of baptism, and then receive the receive the Holy Spirit, right? So repent, re, re, renew your baptismal promises by living and ordering your life 100% uh, and consistent with the mark, the indelible mark of baptism, and then receive the Holy Spirit, and then the reception of the Holy Spirit, in that reception is where the, re, the, the reconciliation with God the Father takes place. So repent, renew, receive similar to that threefold formula, it's fit, fitting within the context. Um, here's something, a quote from Father Morris, and let's kind of wrap it up with this. I think we have to, again, we're talking about seeing the overarching program, an overarching tap and deep dive into tradition, I think is absolutely critical for liberation, uh, for us to, re to renew what you call reclamation theology, reclaiming the riches, the treasure house, the theological treasure house, including St. Thomas, including going deep into the virtues, including understand person according to St. Thomas. Here's something that Father, Gabe, Father Gabriel Amorth writes. He says, uh, well, first, um, um, this is what I wrote. The program includes a neglected aspects of penitential posture requisite for liberation. That's the repent, right? We've neglected that. We want to jump, go straight to third base, right? That is, while uh, um, we will teach you set prayers to assist in liberation. There is no magic bullet. As Father Gabriel Amorth writes, quote, there is a, always a strong temptation for charismatic sensitives and exorcists of finding the quickest way to heal by going outside the common sacred means to obtain grace. Those who seek quick solution, he says, outside of the ordinary channels of attaining grace, he says, quote, unwittingly fall into the trap of magic. This is this is the most respective one of the most respective uh, exorcists of our day uh, who recently passed away. Comment on that, Kyle. Well, he's precisely right, and we see this over and over again. Um, you mentioned earlier the definition of healing in the true Catholic sense 
in a true Catholic traditional sense, the definition of healing is reconciliation with God the Father through the sacraments. It is not the cessation of physical suffering or psychological uh, suffering. It's not the cessation of affliction. The demon is there because of defect. The demon is there because there is a psychological compatibility of, in the fallen human and the, and the fallen angel. The demon is there in the same way that a contagion or bacteria is present in a wound. There is a lack of cleansing. There's a lack of commitment to healing. There's a lack of something. So he's there. He serves a purpose, but he's there because of defect. And so it's exactly what Father Amorth is talking about. And, and the medical model is that uh, modern uh, deliverance, especially um, the programs which focus on the emotional aspect of it, these treat symptomology. They do not treat root cause. They do not treat the disease. They're simply a Band-Aid or uh, a pain pill, and this does not affect the cure. But we are a, uh, a world of snowflakes. We don't want it to hurt. We don't want it to be difficult. There was a time in Catholicism when we recognized the value of a long illness. We recognized the value of suffering as an opportunity to do reparation and to prepare ourselves for the beatific vision while here on earth. Um, these concepts are gone because we've bought into the secular notion um, that, we sh that, that suffering has no value or that suffering is somehow uh, a waste, and it is absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah, excellent point. Anything else you want to cover? Oh, Dan, I think that we've touched uh, two or three different subjects that we could go back and capture. Um, I'm looking forward to a continued series of, of these talks. Um, if you, whoever hears these, uh, whether you hear them on YouTube or however, however you hear them, Give feedback to Libra Cristo if you want to hear more of this uh, of these discussions. We look forward to the publication uh, by Tan Publishing of, of the book by Dr. Dan Schneider, uh, and which uh, will be coming out soon. But it talks deeply about these subjects. It's cross-referenced. It's footnoted, and you're going to get these references. For instance, it tracks this dub, this triple R formula, this RRR formula back to the early 2000s in its current form, um, being used by exorcists, the development of it. And then um, now we're even, we're still hearing this mentioned on a national stage by uh, um, um, oh, <laughs> prominent, by prominent practitioners uh, of liberation. You're still, you're, you're hearing this. And so this it, is it a lasting weapon. It's it's yeah, yeah, this is a proven weapon. It's proven in the field, uh, but again, it's contextual. So thank you for the opportunity to visit with you, Dan. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks for meeting up. We'll do it again next month. Thanks.